Okay, welcome back to the channel, football fans, for another episode of Gridiron Legends. Today, we're continuing our review of the Hall of Fame class of 1967. Now, stay tuned as we dig into the past with our spotlight on one Bobby Lane. Make sure you watch until the end when we get into the infamous Curse of Bobby Lane. Now, let's see what we can find out. Okay, let's get into the uh, Hall of Fame profile for Bobby Lane. He was inducted in the class of 1967 as a quarterback. He has three NFL titles to his name. He piled up 26,768 passing yards while rushing for 2,451, played for 15 seasons, and, and he has 196 touchdowns. All right, so let's go ahead and get into his bio here. So Bobby Lane, during his 15 pro football seasons, was a free-spirited, all-NFL caliber quarterback who did well statistically, but was exceptional in the intangibles, leadership, determination, competitiveness, and guts. Lane left pro football with a legend that may never be exactly duplicated. Bobby's story deals with sterling accomplishments on the field, but also with his penchant for enjoying every moment off the field, even if that meant on occasion a big night out in the town just hours before a crucial game. While it's likely that some of Lane's off-the-field activities have been exaggerated, there's no question he did not always subscribe to the general rules of team behavior. So it may be that Lane's pro football success hinged on a relationship he developed with a wise and understanding coach, Raymond Buddy Parker, who understood what made Bobby tick. The two combined their talents to produce the most successful years in Detroit Lions history. The Lions won divisional crowns in 1952, 53, and 54, and NFL titles in 1952 and 53. And in both title game victories, Lane and the Lions defeated the Cleveland Browns. In the 1953 game, Bobby enjoyed his greatest and certainly most famous afternoon. The Browns held a 16 to 10 advantage with four minutes and 10 seconds left to play, and Lane coolly directed the team on an 80 yard touchdown drive that combined with Doak Walker's extra point kick gave the Lions a 17-16 win. In 1957, Parker left the Lions to coach the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lane and the Lions won the NFL championship that season, and one year later, Lane joined Parker in Pittsburgh through a trade. The Parker-Lane duo provided the Steelers with some of their finest seasons up to that time. Bobby Lane was a never-say-die competitor. His longtime friend and fellow Hall of Famer, Doak Walker, came. Some days, time just ran out on him. A pretty interesting bio there. Uh, let's see what else we can dig up in our own research. Okay, Bobby Lane was born in Santa Ana, Texas, and uh, grew up on a farm in Coleman County, just north of Santa Ana. Uh, his father, only 36, died of a heart attack when Lane was eight years old. His mother, B, was so destitute she could not afford to keep the family together. Uh, his two sisters stayed with his mother while he was sent to Fort Worth to live with his aunt and uncle. His aunt and uncle eventually adopted Lane and moved to Highland Park, Texas, which was then a suburb just north of Dallas. He attended Highland Park High School and University Park, and Lane's best friend and football teammate was fellow future Hall of Famer Doak Walker, the Heisman Trophy winner in 1948 for the SMU Mustangs, and he was a pro teammate with Lane uh, with the Detroit Lions. So in his senior year, Lane was named to the All-State football team uh, and played in the Oil Bowl of All-Star Game. Uh, he also led Highland Park to the state semifinals where they eventually fell to the state champion San Angelo, uh, 21 to 20. He went on to play uh, quarterback for Texas and was one of their most successful quarterbacks ever. Uh, he was se selected to four straight All-Southwest Conference teams from 1944 to 47 and was a consensus All-American in the senior year. In his freshman season, Lane became a very rare player in that era uh, to start his first game. He missed his second game due to an injury and was replaced by future North Star transfer Zeke Martin. But Lane played the rest of the season and led the Longhorns to within one point of the Southwest Conference Championship when they lost to TCU 7-6 on a missed extra point. Prior to and during his sophomore year, he spent eight months in the Merchant Marine serving time with his friend Doak Walker. He missed the first six games of the season and was replaced by Jack Halfpenny. The last game he missed was the team's only loss to Rice by one point. Texas went 10-1, and won the Southwest Conference, and despite playing only half a season, Lane again made the all-conference team. 
In the Cotton Bowl Classic following that season, Texas beat Missouri 40-27, to where Lane played perhaps the best game of his career. He set several NCAA and Cotton Bowl records that have lasted into the 21st century. In that game, he completed 11 of 12 passes and accounted for every one of the team's 40 points, scoring four touchdowns, kicking four field goals, and throwing for two other scores. Thus, he was named one of the game's outstanding players. In 1946, the Longhorns were ranked first in the preseason for the first time, uh, but after beating number 20 Arkansas, they were upset by number 16 Rice and later by unranked TCU. They went 8 and 2, finished third in the conference ranked 15th nationally, and missed out on any bowl games. Lane led the Southwest Conference in total offense with 1,420 yards, total passing with 1,115 yards, and punting average of 42 yards per punt. Despite the unexpected finish, Lane was named All-Conference again and finished 8th in Heisman Trophy balloting to Glenn Davis of Army. In 1947, Blair Cherry replaced Dana X. Bible as head coach at Texas and decided to install the T-formation offense. Cherry, Lane, and their wives spent several weeks in Wisconsin studying the new offense at the training camps of the Chicago Bears and Chicago Cardinals of the National Football League. The change was a success as Lane led the Southwest Conference in passing yards, made the All-Conference and All-American teams, and finished sixth in the Heisman Trophy voting to John Lujak of Notre Dame. The Longhorns, after beating number 19 North Carolina, started the season ranked third. They then beat number 15 Oklahoma, but as it happens, in 1945, Texas was again denied an undefeated season by a missed extra point. After coming back once against Walker's number 8 SMU, Texas again found itself behind late in the game. Lang engineered a fourth quarter touchdown drive that would have tied the game, but kicker Frank Guess pushed the extra point wide and the Longhorns lost 14-13. They fell to eighth and finished behind SMU in the Southwest Conference, but gained an invitation to the Sugar Bowl, where Lane and the Longhorns beat number six Alabama. As a result of his 10 of 24, 183 yard performance, Lane won the inaugural Miller Digby Award presented to the game's most valuable player. The Longhorns finished ranked fifth, the best finish in Lane's career. Lane finished his Texas career with a school record 3,145 passing yards on 210 completions and 400 attempts and 28 wins. Lane would be drafted into the National Football League by the Pittsburgh Steelers with the third overall selection of the 1948 NFL Draft and was the second overall selection in the 1948 AAFC Draft by the Baltimore Colts. Lane did not want to play for the Steelers, the last team in the NFL to use single-wing formation, so his rights were quickly traded to the Chicago Bears. He was offered $77,000 to play for the Colts, but George Hallis, who attended the Sugar Bowl victory over Alabama and sat with Cherry and Lane after the game, sweet-talked him into signing with the Bears. He promised a slow rise to fame in the big leagues with a no-trade understanding. After one season with the Bears in 1948, during which Lane was the third-string quarterback behind both Sid Luckman and Johnny Lujak, Lane refused to return and tried to engineer his own trade to the Green Bay Packers while the Bears opposed a separate attempt by the Chicago Cardinals. Hallis, preoccupied with fending off a challenge from AAFC, but also didn't want him to play for his rivals in the league, traded Lane to the New York Bulldogs for two draft picks and $50,000 cash to be paid in four installments, with a clause barring Lane from ever playing for the Cardinals. With Lane at quarterback, the Bulldogs won only one game and lost 11, but Lane played well and developed quickly. Lane compared one season with the soon-to-be-defunct New York Bulldogs as worth five seasons with any other NFL team. In 1950, he was traded to the Detroit Lions for wide receiver Bob Mann, and the Lions agreed to make the final three payments to Hallis. For the next five years, Lane was reunited with his great friend and Highland Park High School teammate Doak Walker, and together they helped make Detroit into a champion. In 1952, Lane led the Lions to their first NFL championship in 17 years, and they did so again in 1953 for back-to-back -back league titles. They fell short of a three-peat in 1954 when they lost 56-10 to the Cleveland Browns in the NFL championship game, a loss which Lane explained by saying, I slept too much last night. In 1955, the team finished last in the conference, and Walker surprisingly retired at the top of his game. As Walker had been the team's kicker, Lane took over the kicking duties in 1956 and 57, and in 1956 led the league in field goal accuracy. In 1956, the Lions finished second in the conference, missing the championship game by only one game. 
1957, the season of the Lions' most recent NFL championship, Lane broke his leg in three places in a pileup during the 11th game of the 12-game season. His replacement, Tobin Rote, finished the season and led the Lions to victory in the championship game in Detroit, a 59-14 route of the Cleveland Browns. After the second game of the 1958 season, Pittsburgh Steelers coach Buddy Parker, formerly in Detroit, arranged a trade on October 6 that brought Lane to the Steelers. During his eight seasons in Detroit, the Lions won three NFL championships, and Lane played in four Pro Bowls, made first-team All-Pro twice, and at various times led the league in over a dozen single-season statistical categories. Following the trade, Lane played five seasons with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Though he made the Pro Bowl two more times, he never made it back to the playoffs, and the team's best finish was second in the conference in 1962. During his last year in the NFL, he published his autobiography, Always on Sunday. Later, he stated that the biggest disappointment in his football career was having never won a championship for the Pittsburgh Steelers, and specifically, Art Rooney. By the time Lane retired before the 1963 season, he owned the NFL records for passing attempts with 3,700, completions with 1,814, touchdowns 196, passing yards with 26,768, and interceptions with 243. He left the game as one of the last players to play without a face mask and was credited with creating the two-minute drill. Okay, the curse of Bobby Lane. Let's get into it. Uh, Bobby Lane seized with anger as he emptied his locker. The Lions had just traded him. One of the NFL's greatest players, a quarterback who helped them win three championships for a prospect and some draft picks. It was just two games into the 1958 season, and the Lions were the defending NFL champs. The trade was simply inexplicable. Teammates and beat writers milled about as the colorful, quotable, and wildly popular Lane packed his belongings into a suitcase for Pittsburgh. As he left the Lions locker room for the last time, Lane delivered his parting shot at his foolish former employers. This team will not win for another 50 years, he said. Now, none of the professional sports writers within earshot bothered to put the juicy quote in their newspapers. But the football gods heard Lane's decree and passed judgment on the Lions. The team spent five decades wandering in a wilderness of losing seasons, playoff failures, and quarterback controversies. In fact, it's now going on six decades. The poor Lions still labor under the curse of Bobby Lane today. Or so the story goes. Now, like any good urban legend, there is more and less to this tale than meets the eye. Lane almost certainly did not curse the Lions on the fateful day of his trade in 1958. But what did happen was pretty remarkable. In an era when the NFL was not fractionally as popular as it is now, Lane was one of the league's most recognizable stars. The Lions also were one of the NFL's best in the 50s. They beat the Browns for the league championship in 1952 and 53 before losing to them in 1954. Lane had a gunslinger reputation. He is often cited as the innovator of the two-minute offense. He was also a notorious partier in an era when hard-drinking quarterbacks were considered charming rapscallions, not TMZ fodder. When Bobby Lane said block, you block. And when he said drink, you drank, said teammate Yale Larry. Head coach Buddy Parker, who had a reputation as a wheeler dealer, traded for quarterback Tobin Rote in the offseason. Rote was an established Pro Bowl starter from Green Bay, who was slightly younger and, again, slightly less enamored of the nightlife than Lane. Whatever Parker had in mind for Lane and Rote never happened. Parker abruptly resigned as Lions head coach in August of 1957, calling the Lions the worst team I've ever seen in training camp and telling reporters that they had no life, no go, it's a completely dead team. Offensive assistant George Wilson, a close friend of Lane's, took over as head coach. Lane was then arrested for drunk driving just before the start of the season. Lane was reportedly driving on the wrong side of the center lane with five passengers, two men and three women, in the car and his headlights off. He reportedly kept poking the officer who pulled him over in the shoulder, forcing the hand of a patrolman who, in those days, might have given a famous quarterback a police escort home instead of a mugshot. 
Now, according to the Detroit Athletic Company, Lane later claimed that he only drank six highballs that night and that the officer mistook his Texas drawl for slurred speech. Lane was later acquitted in December. In addition to coaching and drunk driving controversies, the Lions had perhaps the NFL's first truly great quarterback controversy on its hands. Wilson rotated Rote and Lane based on which quarterback had the best week of practice. It's easy to read between the lines and assume that Wilson started whichever quarterback had the most sober week of practice. The rotation system ended when Lane broke his leg early in an important late-season Browns game. Rote relieved him and led the Lions to a 20-7 victory. Rote then beat the Bears, then the 49ers in the playoff game, and then the Browns again by a 59-14 score for the Lions' third NFL championship of the decade. Wilson entered the 58 season planning to platoon Lane and Rote again. Rote relieved Lane in a 28-15 loss to the Colts in the season opener, and then both quarterbacks played in a 13-13 tie against the Packers. Wilson criticized both quarterbacks' play calling after the game, and Detroit News would later report that Lane showed up for a team meeting intoxicated the Saturday before the game and that a rift had grown between Lane and Wilson. In summary, Lane was a 31-year-old quarterback coming off an arrest in two straight seasons that ended with injuries, while his backup or challenger, a younger veteran with a solid resume, beat the team's arch-rival twice to win a championship. The Lions were so friction-wrecked that their longtime coach quit on them during training camp a year earlier. The Bobby Lane trade was major news in Detroit on Tuesday, October 7, 1958. It earned a banner headline above the masthead of the Detroit Free Press that day. Below the masthead were headlines about the health of Pope Pius X and an auto workers' strike, the latter of which was extremely important to everyday life in the Motor City. According to Smith, Parker called Wilson about acquiring some game film that Monday morning. By the end of the phone call, the Steelers had Lane and the Lions had quarterback Earl Morrill, who was the second pick in the 1956 draft, plus a pair of draft picks. According to the Free Press, Lane heard about the trade while he was at the Detroit Metropolitan Airport waiting for his wife to arrive from their Texas home. Lane eventually spoke to the press while packing for a late night flight to Pittsburgh. It's just one of those things, he said. I guess they always work out for the best. But actually, it hurts me, Lane added. It hurts quite a bit. I haven't got much complaint, I guess, but regardless of what people think of me, I gave my heart and soul to play football. I have really tried to play my best. I've got an awful lot of friends here and I hate to leave. Teammates reacted with shock and dismay. It makes me sick, linebacker Joe Schmidt said. I think it's a big mistake. He's still a damn good quarterback. As for fate, or the curse, would have it, Rote suffered a painful pull of the right leg and practiced the Tuesday after Lane left. Morrill took over, and the newcomer seemed nervous, according to the Free Press beat writer George Puskas. Further, defensive coach Buster Ramsey hinted that players were dogging it with injuries. When we were winning, we never had anybody hurt, Ramsey said. Puskas quoted several on-and-off record Lions players, saying that Lane's departure had cast a pall over the team. Rote and Morrill split time in the Lions' next game, a 42-28 loss to the Rams. The Lions ended the season 4-7-1, though Rote played well for much of the year. Lane, meanwhile, led the Steelers to a 7-4-1 record, their best mark in more than a decade. Lane had a few decent seasons with the Steelers, but never led the team to the playoffs. He retired after the 1962 season, entered the oil business, and disappeared from the limelight. The Lions, who obviously had some locker room problems in the late 50s, faded for a few years but rebounded under Wilson with a great defensive team led by Alex Karras and Dick Night Train Lane, plus some decent quarterback play from Morrill and Milt Plum. The 1960s Lions never reached the playoffs, but an intensive scan of the newspaper articles found no mention of any lingering Lane curse. Lane flipped a coin before Super Bowl XXVI at the old Silverdome in Pontiac, Michigan in 1982. The Lions had made the playoffs just once since Lane left 25 years earlier, and the team was in the midst of a never-ending quarterback controversy between Gary Danielson and Eric Hippel. A coin flip press appearance sounds like the perfect time to bring up the old saw about how you once cursed your team in the heat of anger after a sudden trade. But the Detroit Free Press feature on Lane was devoted largely to drinking stories. Lane died on December 1, 1986. Newspaper eulogies featured lots of tales from old columnists in various cities who stayed out until all hours of the night with Lane. They celebrated the rakish gunslinger, but none of the eulogists mentioned Lane's animosity towards the Lions 
or an old story about how an angry Lane cast a spell on the franchise that traded him. In the 1990s, the Lions were a very good team. Barry Sanders led them to the postseason five times in 10 years, but they kept losing in the playoffs, in large part because of a run-and-shoot offense that made mediocre quarterbacks look like Lane-esque gunslingers until the playoffs brought tough defenses and cold weather. If the curse of Bobby Lane was invoked by anyone, it did not make its way into any source of record. The phrase, curse of Bobby Lane, does not appear in any newspaper until October 12, 2001. Jerry Green, a legendary Detroit football writer, began his column in the Detroit News with a brief primer about Lane. He drank a wee dram now and then. He led the Lions to championships. He was traded. Fast forward 43 years in the team that shuffled Plum and Morrill, Hipple and Danielson, and other doomed platoons was swapping between Charlie Batch and Ty Detmer. Perhaps, just perhaps, the Lions are gripped by the curse of Bobby Lane, Green wrote. The tone of the article suggests Green was introducing readers to a new idea. If he was citing some well-known local lore, he probably wouldn't have spent four paragraphs reminding readers about who Bobby Lane was. Green, who covered the Lions for decades, writes nothing at all about Lane's muttering a curse under his breath. His only quote from the era is one from Joe Schmidt. They traded away the guy who made pro football in Detroit. There is no mention of a 50-year curse. The curse disappears from the record again until 2008, when Bob Wojnowski of the Detroit News did a thorough examination of the legend because A, the 50 years were about to expire, and B, the Lions were in the process of going 0-16. Wojnowski sought out Schmidt. I don't recall Bobby saying it, Schmidt said, but if he did, it was probably in jest or frustration. Bobby gets credit for a lot of things he never did. Green weighed in again on Lane in November of that doomed Lions season, sharing another round of tales about Lane's gifts for revelry and camaraderie. Green then brings up the curse he mentioned seven years earlier in a similar column. There has been much speculation and conjecture about a curse of Bobby Lane, Green wrote on November 12, 2008. It is sheer nonsense. There never was anything reported back then that Lane vowed the Lions would be cursed with defeat for the next 50 years. Those are strong words from the first newspaper writer to ever mention the very thing he is condemning. ESPN.com's Greg Garber interviewed Lane's son Alan in 2013 in an effort to track down the curse. Alan Lane said he had never heard anything about the curse until 10 years before the interview. He was astonished to discover the entire websites dedicated to his father's alleged words, Garber wrote. But he admitted it was totally consistent with who his father was. Mitch Albom, a Detroit columnist before he became a best-selling author, weighed in during Garber's article. As the years went past, the curse got more body to it, Albom said. It was a whisper once, and then it was like, maybe this thing is really happening. And then it just became an explanation. The curse seems to have spontaneously generated about the time that Green wrote his 2001 column. Perhaps Green's musings got mixed with the general sense that the Lions were cursed in some way, grafted with their own narrative, and found themselves part of established local lore. That's the perfect recipe for an urban legend. The curse of Bobby Lane may just be a case of old sports writer romanticism. Lane is a symbol of a light of the jukebox era when writers and players got tipsy and chased women together. The Lions traded Lane for modern, business-oriented reasons. Of course they were cursed by the angry football gods. Over the years, a hunk of sour grapes conventional wisdom, this team ain't been the same since they traded old Bobby, got passed down from parents to children, old beat writers to young, talk radio callers to impressionable listeners. Jerry Green whipped up the curse of Bobby Lane as a column hook, and it sounded like something everyone had known for years. But it never happened. And that's the curse of Bobby Lane. Yeah, a really cool story uh, to hear about the curse of Bobby Lane and how it never happened. Uh, but is still part of team lore today. All right, that wraps up our spotlight on Bobby Lane, another great player of the NFL of the past. And how about that infamous curse? Is that something you knew about before today? Honestly, I had heard of it and forgotten about it prior to seeing his name come up for this week's episode. Now, I think Dan Campbell might have something to do with lifting it after all these years. Let's hope so. All right, thanks for joining me for today's trip into the past. Join me again next week as we continue our review of the Hall of Fame class of 1967. And don't forget, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and tell a friend. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.